And it just reminds me, when we had the first one of these symposia uh, three and a half years ago, and we, everyone, we talked about the future, and we talked the future that patient experience would be transparent, it would help and engage all patients, whatever their age, whatever their learning ability, whatever their language, and we would build a trip advisor for health, which would put free text comments to help patients and their families understand the care system and help individual clinicians and provider organisations to understand what they were doing and that this would change healthcare. Um, this was three and a bit years ago and now I'm sort of genuinely just in awe of what you've done in Cumbria, of what you've done in First Community and what all of you are doing because it's happening. And before it was a dream and a vision and now it's absolutely happening. And everybody here is part of that because you're sort of self-selected as people who, who get this stuff, who actually want to make the patient experience at the centre of everything. So, you know, I hope and I genuinely believe that when we're back here in five years' time, and you'll be here, and there'll be people who weren't here, and you'll remember when it started and when it really got traction and when you saw the first example, 3,000 children and young people in Cumbria have rated and reviewed their care. That's just, that has never, ever been done. That's never been done anywhere in the world. So uh, it's not, not thanks to it. It's all of what you're doing. And many of you here who aren't speaking today, I know have done similar incredible things in your organisations. Uh, you don't all, you're not all lucky enough to have the incredible leadership at the top of the organisation that Hugh provides in Cumbria. Uh, but despite that, you've done wonderful things. But I know that in three or four years' time, what you're doing here, what you're doing there, what you're doing will be the norm there will be a complete, transparent patient experience system. So I just wanted to say that again and thank the people who have already spoken. Um, I'm going to make an announcement now, which I'm not meant to make until the end. You've all got forms to provide your feedback, and you'll see in a very cheesy way we've made it look like a friends and family form. Now, I'm not going to say fill it in now before you hear me, because that would be gaming the system. But I am quite sure I want you to keep that feeling you've got of, wow, what a great day, what superb speakers, <coughs> for when you fill in the form and don't be, um, uh, don't be diluted at all by the next 20 minutes. So do remember to fill in your forms uh, about the whole day uh, and I'm going to say it again at the end but if I forget to say that I'm in big trouble with the team at the back so I wanted to say that. Um, as I say, I'm gonna, I'll keep this really short because you've had a long day, you've had great speakers and everyone likes it when an event finishes early. The vision uh, of I Want Great Care is the vision that you share that patient experience is absolutely critical. That everybody you look after will get a superb experience if, whenever possible. Some of us work uh, in very, very difficult testing circumstances, whether social challenges our patients have, whether um, end of life care, whether your really resource is tight, there's long waiting lists. But everybody shares that common passion that the patient experience should be as good as it possibly can. Every patient will get the care you'd want for your family, for your parents, every time. Not occasionally, not just when the CQC are visiting, not when you get a visit from the chief exec, but all the time. So the, the vision of I Want Great Care was just to help organisations and individuals do that. And you've seen examples today of how it is already happening. Um, these overnight successes take a long time. So we're six years in, and you've described a, a sort of two-year gestation before you gave birth, Hugh, to this thing. Uh, a two-year gestation, and that actually is incredibly quick. It took, I think, it took um, the Department of Health or the NHS at least eight years to spend £7 billion on the NA Connecting for Health system, and that still didn't really work. So to do something like we've seen in two years, to do what first community have done in two years is, is incredible. So I'm sure you're not, but don't be disheartened when it takes a few months, a couple of years to get the traction with these things. Um, we talked to someone, uh, Hugh mentioned TripAdvisor. Stephen Kaufer, who's the guy who founded TripAdvisor, uh, he's still the chief exec, 16 years later. He didn't sort of build a business and then disappear. Um, and he says the story. Everyone knows TripAdvisor now, isn't it? Well, oh, it's where you go if you're going to find a hotel, a bed and breakfast. Uh, for the first 10 years when they were building that, and now, you know, you just take it for granted. For the first 10 years, really hard work. They were running out of money. He was mortgaging his house, remortgaging their house. It was just hard, no reviews, low response rates, all the challenges that we're seeing. 
And then it just suddenly, from hard work and persistence and vision, it just breaks through. And now they're where they are. We're in healthcare, we're at the bit where it's just breaking through uh, across all of healthcare. And it doesn't matter who people use, whether they work with us, whether they work with someone else, it's about getting the voice of the patient at the heart of everything. You've heard examples today of how staff morale goes up. I think we heard the only complaint is when they don't get their reports. And those of you uh, in, in primary care, general practice, I know some of this, and you're being very polite, but some of it seems too, too good to be true. Can this really be, what, another data collection exercise, more feedback, and the staff are going to love it, and it's going to transform the quality? It just seems hard to believe. But the same challenges and questions and concerns that you're describing are what we heard in this room three years ago from the acute sector. And they've, they've pushed through that. So continue with that, that confidence and that faith. The interesting thing with the TripAdvisor model is that everybody wins. And again, you've seen examples today, and especially just now, how everybody involved here. This isn't just something to help patients, but it will. This isn't just something to help individual nurses and doctors, but it will, and it does. And it's not just something to help commissioners or organisations, but it will. So there's this almost magic thing that patients love when you get it right. Children writing about when they have the injection and how it hurts, how the x-ray department weren't very nice, to people talking about the incredible dignity that their mother was given in the last few weeks of her life. Patients and their families love being asked to give feedback because they want their NHS, their local doctor, their local hospital to be better. So to give them that opportunity to be part of the solution, we want your opinion, we value your words. Help us help the next child with epilepsy, the next patient with liver cancer. People love being asked for their feedback. And then, as we've seen, they love reading it. And you didn't see, in many of those examples, and the ones that John was just showing, a few words, or good, or nice, people often write paragraphs. Paragraphs and paragraphs. Um, so patients love it. Staff we've heard as well. I don't believe there's anybody working in healthcare who, who doesn't get a buzz and a feeling of, of great when they see the feedback from their patients. Um, that feeling that what you do makes a difference, that people who've maybe sat in A&E for four hours or people who brought their child up because they were going to have an operation who, and who were terrified, that feeling, that warmth you give them by giving kind, compassionate, professional care. And when they feed that back and you get a little alert on your phone or a little, a little ping in your email, it feels good. It feels good whether you're a community <coughs> a physio, a GP, a surgeon, doesn't matter, it feels great. So you've got something that where both, the, both sides of the equation win. This isn't a, a stick that's used to beat staff. It's not, we need, it's not a dull, boring survey that patients have to fill in and never see the impact. Both sides win, and then organisations win. Um, the title, Transformation of Healthcare Providers, and we've got a comma there now, which is good, Staff Morale on the Lives of the Patient. If I just give a couple of examples of each. So how do you transform the best healthcare providers? Notice we didn't say transforming the worst or transforming the average. Let's, let's aim really, really, really high. Um, so... Transforming healthcare providers, and I don't think there's anyone here today from the Royal Marsden, but we've worked with the Royal Marsden for sort of a year and a half now, and their chief nurse, their very nice lady, Shel Shelley, Shelby, Shelby, Shelley, Shelley, yeah, I was I putting a B in, um, and Shelley, you know, I think they're fair to say that the Royal Marsden are probably up there as one of the best organisations. I think we're all probably proud that the NHS has such a high-profile, uh, successful cancer hospital, and she will talk to you about how getting continuous feedback from patients and their families, even though they knew they were good, even they knew their clinical outcomes were great. Clinical outcomes are important, but they're not the be-all and end-all. They're really, really important. But she will tell you that continuously feeding the words of patients and their families back to the staff drives up morale. And how do you measure that? Well, and I mentioned it a couple of times to people today, when you do this properly, um, and it was, in fact, one of your partners in, in the Cumbria, uh, community, healthcare community, uh, not in the community, in the healthcare metrics. So what they found was when they started feeding back to the frontline staff the words and comments of patients, absenteeism and sickness rate amongst the nursing staff fell. So this, to be precise, this was a Morecambe Bay. So they'd had 
big challenges. Big, big challenges. Not due to what any of the people there today were doing, but due to awful events from a few staff two or three years ago. But the impact had been the same, that staff morale was low, absenteeism was high, and we have to talk money, because if I talk without notes and don't mention the economy, it's not what you're meant to do, is it? You have to mention the economy in your talk without notes. So they were spending a lot of money that was coming out of the local healthcare economy on agency staff and bank staff. And I, don't, I know there's no one here from an acute provider who doesn't understand that agency staff and bank staff is expensive and every trust wants to try and reduce it. Cut a long story short, three months after putting in place the system, actually the system that the CCG had procured for them, they found that the absenteeism rate and the sickness of the nursing staff fell. As a result, they were able to spend less money on agency nurses. So that's money that went back into healthcare. So when people say, well, how do you know morale goes up? These are just surely soft stories. You point them to Morecambe Bay, and we've got a range of other similar ones where absenteeism has fallen. It's like real results that benefits patients. The best nurses, the best midwives are going to work. They're there. They're delivering care. So this is about transformation. And if we look on a bigger scale at the challenges the NHS faces over the next five years, ten years, imagine if we could reduce absenteeism by 1% or 2% across the whole NHS simply by feeding back what patients say to the frontline teams every, every Monday. So in Morecambe Bay, they reduced their absenteeism in that unit from 7% to 3%. So that's massive. Now, we don't have to do that everywhere, but if we, and, all, and that means all of us here, manage to help reduce absenteeism by 1%, that saves hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds and provides better care. So this is where we understand that patient experience and feedback is not a soft, woolly story at the end of a board meeting. It's not something we do to meet a friends and family test requirement or the latest govern government initiative. It's about engaging with clinicians in their heart, why they went into healthcare, and then using that up to drive quality and reduce cost. Another example for healthcare providers, and I'm gonna go from a sort of big thing about saving millions to a, a smaller story. <coughs> a dirty swab under a bed. So uh, a gentleman, elderly patient on a surgical ward in his 70s, he provided, he was sitting there and they got Wi-Fi in the hospital. And many of your hospitals have Wi-Fi now, and it's, sort of, it's coming, it's coming in different places. And he provided feedback and he said, five stars, back to Hughes point, five stars, five stars, lovely nurses, super food, no sausage gate there. Um, but there's a swab under the bed opposite me and it's been there all day and no one's moved it. Dirty swab. Submit. He did it online, Silver Surfer, um, and because he used the term, I think it was the term dirty or swab, anyway, it triggered an alert um, and that's right, and he gave a low score for cleanliness. That fired an instant email to the head of patient experience in that trust. Because we know which uh, ward that had come from, she picked up the phone phoned the, the, the person in charge, I don't know if it was the sister or the matron in charge, on the ward there and then, and said, I think someone from your wards just said there's a swab under the bed. And sort of just looked up, and actually, you know, it's important it's anonymous, but in this case, there was a chap sitting away on his iPad, something away. <laughs> so she walked over, she went under, and there was a swab under the bed. Moved the swab, went over to the gentleman, said, sorry about that, that swab shouldn't have been there, I think you made a comment. And he's like, apparently his face just dropped. <laughs> Could not believe in the NHS, with everything you read about it in the newspapers, how inefficient it is, how technology is rubbish, that someone, he pressed a button and the nurse appeared. <laughs> I think he, th he wished he'd asked for something else. <laughs> think. Uh, apparently he was, an in, he, carried on, he was an inpatient for the rest of the week. Every time someone came to visit him, he told them the story. Uh, and that was told to me by the, the, um, the nursing director. So this is about transformation. This is about bringing healthcare well into the 21st century and beyond. And I'm sure those of you in, in primary care can see how that sort of feedback, being able to respond really quickly and nip things in the bud, is a, as applicable to uh, across primary care community services. <coughs> um, the lives of our patients, and again, I, you, uh, I'll come to a finish here, because it's literally the bottom line, and it's the most important thing. Um, I was going to pull it up, but if I fiddle with the computer, I'll, I'll break it. I will send the link out, and we'll tweet the link out. There's over a million reviews um, on I Want Great Care Now, and there's obviously stuff everywhere else as well. A million reviews, and that's pretty much a million patients who've taken the time and the effort to, to rate and review their care. And 
Some of it's about porridge and sausages and parking. But lots of it uh, are incredible, incredible personal heartfelt stories from people who've made a journey through the healthcare system. They want to say thank you. They want to say, can you do this bit a little bit better? Or they're sometimes angry. But the thing that binds it together is they want to help the next patient. And the one, the review I'm thinking of now, and um, is this from an 18-year-old girl. It was up a couple of months ago, and I'll, I'll retweet it. An 18-year-old girl who was reviewing um, the, the breast surgery unit. And she'd had to have, uh, or decided to have, a double mastectomy aged 18 because she had the BRCA gene. And she's written a long review. Um, basically, the core of it, apart from saying thank you so much to the incredible nurses and doctors who've helped me take this journey and helped me come out the other side, but the core of it is for the next patient. And she says, for any, of, any other woman, any other girl in this situation, please feel reassured. Please feel confident that there is a path through. Um, I cannot thank the team enough and I cannot reassure those of you in this situation that this is a journey that can have an outcome which you feel good about. And you think, God, when you've got an 18 year old girl who's been through such an experience and such a journey, and she decides that for many reasons, but to help the next person, she will go online and type on the web a really intimate personal story um, you realise that there's some incredible power in collecting patient feedback. It's not just in the scores, it's in the narrative, it's in the text. And it's one thing to be able to choose our hotel based on the words of others or our, our hard drive. What patients are doing now, and they're, they're so far ahead of us, they're so far ahead of us, is they are helping others. They're helping others go through incredible journeys that um, we hope that, you know, we don't have to do. But... We've got to make sure that within a few years, everybody going through their own journey, whether it's cancer, whether it's choosing an elective operation, whether it's choosing a journey that they, they can have confidence and trust in, which is most of them, that they can go online and find that information. And then they can share their story and their journey with others. It puts continual pressure on improvement, but that pressure isn't coming from the government of whatever colour. It's not coming from the CQC, it's not coming from NHS England. That pressure to improve is coming directly from patients. And I think we'd all want to think that our organisations and everyone in them are responding every day to the wishes and needs of our, of our patients. I'm going to read one final thing. One of the things we did at I Want Great Care, uh, very lucky to work with WizKids. And WizKids is the, um, one of the, ch well, it's the children's charity for getting... Um, especially disabled children, powered wheelchairs. Um, and in this country, some children wait more than six years to get a powered wheelchair. And that means these children are stuck in their house, often in one room, and their families can't do anything. Stops the whole family. Ch their siblings often don't go to university because it, the whole family is stopped. So WizKids is an awesome charity, as you can tell I'm a, a bit of a fan, and they work to help local authorities, commissioners, but especially to help families overcome that hurdle and get the, the wheelchairs that these, these children need. Now, you perhaps won't be surprised to hear that the quality of wheelchair provision and the provider market, sounds a bit familiar probably for commissioners, is varied. There are some awesome, awesome, dedicated, incredible providers who work whatever it takes, and they get these children the right wheelchair, well fitted, and they get them in the wheelchair in a matter of weeks. But if you literally live on the other side of town or the other side of the country, your wheelchair provider, the one that everyone seems to go to, might take years. They charge a lot. They're, they're not responsive. They don't answer emails. And the children don't get in, in the chair. So there's huge variance in the quality of providers. Now, actually, most families, if they knew they can choose to get their wheelchair from someone else. They can go to the equivalent of an Amazon and say, I don't want my wheelchair from that because everyone says they're rubbish. I want my wheelchair from that company, from that organisation. So WizKids approached us and essentially we built a trip advisor of wheelchair services. And it launched two weeks ago and uh, WizKids are sort of tweeting and using all their contacts and getting it out on the networks. The aim being that every family, hopefully the children themselves, and I was with a 16-year-old guy last night, 
who's in a wheelchair who said, I've rated and reviewed my wheelchair provider, but the children and their families to rate and review it. And if I come back to, and the reason I got this, I got um, an email from a lady called Claire, who's a mum. She's got two children, both with really profound special needs. Um, and she'd heard about this. She'd seen it from WizKids, and I know her anyway. And she says, so what she says, so this is about the lives of our patients. So this is what she says about being able to rate and review wheelchair services. She said, thank you. I'm not very good at being sensible and wordy, but wow, this WizKids, this review service for wheelchairs is totally amazing and will change lives. I am a pushy, she is really pushy if you mean it. Says, I am really pushy and I have always managed to ask and get the equipment my children need. I research it, ask for what I thought was needed and I never let myself be fobbed off. I always said that I would speak up because many parents of children with special needs are worn out, beaten down and under supported in every area of care and it's hard to decide what to push for when your energy is low and your child is sick. So I would always ask and then I would tell others, push for more. This new service will make it so much easier for me to spread the word on the right equipment and the wheelchair providers. Just wow, just wow. And that's just one tiny, tiny service, but you've already seen how what you're enabling, by enabling the voice of the patient and sharing it transparently, you're going to spread that across healthcare. So that instead of looking at healthcare as the sector that's left behind, when the voice of the user and the voice of the patient isn't heard, healthcare, especially in the UK, is the example of when this stuff's done fantastically, when it's done excellently. It will drive the morale of staff up, it will drive poor practice and waste out of healthcare, but most importantly, it will allow all our patients to get the care they want. So I got a bit excited there, and I, I didn't stick to any of the things I was meant to say, but I've been inspired by what we've heard today and what you're doing. Um, and I just thank you all for being part of this journey, for coming today, um, and for sharing so openly your stories. That's the other great thing. People aren't hoarding these successes, they're sharing them with others. So hopefully this day doesn't end here. There's, there's Twitter feed, uh, contacts, and we'll spread all the details if anyone has any other questions. Part of I Want Correct Care's job is to put people in contact. We need to duck and keep out of the way, because Hugh and John know the answers, and Liz and Liz know the answers. Um, and West Hearts and Watford are doing incredible things and there's incredible stuff happening across the country. So our job is to duck, put you all into contact and then as you say, uh, ratings and reviews are key and all the feedback we get allows us to make the service better. So thank you for today. Thank you for filling in your feedback forms. Um, obviously invite any questions. And I'm just going to start, for, there's a couple here on the, the hashtag Ask I Want Great Care. So, there were two qu things that people have already asked, and I'm not sure who's best to answer these. One was how can we improve A&E response rates? That's a very acute sector thing. Um, and I'm going to... I don't know people might want to say who they were, who, de who did that. But we can, I'm going to suggest, rather than everyone talk about that, whoever it was, come and see me, because I'm going to put you in touch with the people in our team who are fantastic at doing that. We've had um, A&Es getting a 5% response rate. 5% response rate, turning it into 24%? Looking at you. Higher? Lower? Yeah. yeah. And then that was that one's maternity, doesn't I'm looking at the wrong person. Yeah. Yeah, five twenty. So examples where response rates were five percent. Thirty-five percent, thank you. Um, so we can sort of share that knowledge. And then the other one, how can GP practices engage with patients? And it says worried about patient response. And that there's two ways to look at that. Are we worried about the patient response when they're asked to provide feedback, or are we worried that the patient response will be low? It's probably the former, I should think. Uh, well, hopefully we've covered the former. Your patients will love being asked. They will love being asked to provide feedback. And in terms of being worried about the response rate, whether it will be high enough, again, there are practices already across the country who in months, in weeks, have got hundreds and hundreds of pieces of patient feedback. Um, we talked about that journey. So <coughs> thank you very much for your time. Uh, for coming because I appreciate that time's precious and everyone's come, many people have come a long, long way for this. Uh, you are, it's up to you now to go out and be the catalysts and the drivers for this in your other communities. Get your practices doing it, spread the word, get your staff engaged in the hospitals and if there's anything you think we need to do better, then, then tell us and, and we'll do that. But otherwise, thank you very much and thank you for everything you're doing.